Krista. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to apologize for all of the Wi-Fi issues that we're having, but I thank you for your faithfulness. By the time that you're watching this, it might not be morning anymore. So thank you for tuning in and still take this time with your family, with everybody in your house, and just be alone with the Lord this morning. Let's raise him up and praise and worship him. Because in the midst of everything going on around us, he is so worthy. is crowned with glory now the savior knelt to wash our feet and now at his feet we bow the one who wore our sin and shame and now robed in
Church, I know that during this time it can seem so overwhelming, like such a heavy weight, not knowing what's to come. This is also such a beautiful time that the Lord is using. Please make no mistake about that, that he is using this time with you for his glory. So we encourage you to be in conversation with him, to tell him, you are my everything. I cherish you, Lord. I adore you, Lord. And as you're saying that, I encourage you to take a moment and hear him saying it back to you. You are held during this time. This next song that we go into, let this be your cry out to him. Father, I need you.
let that be our cry today. Father, we need you so desperately. And Lord, I pray that we would take a moment at this moment, this very time, just to let everything else escape from our mind and just be in your stillness so we can truly know that we are held. Father, I know that you're moving in this time. You have been so faithful over and over and over again. So Lord, help me be faithful. Help us be faithful. You're not done. Father, we love you. And we praise you. It's in your son's sweet name we pray. Amen. pray. Father, we come before you in the name that we've been singing about, the name that is victorious, the name that is above all names, the name that brings life, the name that every knee shall bow. His name is Jesus. Lord, we come to you in the name of your only begotten Son, and we ask now that, Lord, you would speak to us from the written word who speaks of the living word. Lord, I pray that you would speak to me, speak through me, Lord. Lord, let your word go forth. People don't need to hear from me. They need to hear from you. And so, Lord, I just offer this time to you now. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So our, our nation recently celebrated what we call Independence Day, the 4th of July. And for, if you go to a quick Wikipedia search, what exactly is Independence Day? It tells you that we are declaring our independence from Britain, from a foreign king. And so as Americans, we have, have taken great pride in celebrating um, our independence. And if you're like me, you enjoy all the creature comforts that we normally do on the 4th of July. For my family and for many of us in the church, we participate in the parade. But this year, there was no 4th of July parade. And then some 4th of Julys, I actually would go out and enjoy a concert in the park with the family and eat hot dogs and watch the fireworks. And again, this year there was no concert in the park. And then some years, my family and I would be vacationing and we would go to a ballpark. And there's nothing more American than Chevrolet, baseball, hot dogs, and apple pie is what they say. And so we were there celebrating the 4th of July, and then afterwards you enjoy the firework display. But again, this year, there's no Major League Baseball to watch. And then you turn on the TV, and then you begin to see all the images of this virus called COVID-19 and how it spreads and how it's spiking and then in some places it's flatlining. And then just a matter of minutes, the TV will go from the COVID-19 to the civil unrest. And you see peaceful protesters protesting injustice. But then you also see riots. You see monuments being torn.
torn down. You see people supporting police and you see people against the police. You see our president. Then you see the person who's running against him for president and they have their own views of what's going on. And then you see the nation quickly drawing sides and saying, I'm on the red side, I'm on the blue side. And, and I'm not talking about the Crips and the Bloods. I'm talking about the Republicans and the Democrats. And then something magical happens, at least in my neighborhood, in the midst of all of this. Families are out in their, neighbor, in their front yard popping fireworks. And for a brief moment in time, it feels like everything is right in this great nation. And there's a little bit of irony there because we are in a recession. And I would guesstimate billions of dollars are being literally blown away. It's lighting up the night sky. And there we are. Ooh. Ah, ooh, it's three in the morning. Stop popping the fireworks already. And this is the nation we live in. On one hand, everything is, it feels like there's something wrong. And then you turn on the TV and you see all the warning signs. Something is wrong, something is wrong, something is wrong. And then we go into this, Everything's not that bad. Let's just pop fireworks and pretend everything is okay. This month marks one year that my son, Justice, was diagnosed with cancer. It was last July that we got the diagnosis. We were returning from our family vacation, and you get the news that nobody ever wants to get that your son has cancer. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever gotten that kind of news, but there's a couple of things that went through my mind. I felt like I had two decisions to make. Either one, I could just pretend like everything was okay. Just to put my head in the sand and just say, it's, it's going to be okay. And I don't really want to know how bad this really is. I just don't want to just think about it. I just want to ignore it. But many of you know how cancer works. If you ignore it, it will slowly just spread and slowly begin to destroy. Or the second option would be to take my son to MD Anderson and to go and visit all the specialists and the experts and they do this MRI and CAT scan and then they show you what we cannot see. This is the tumor. Where it's at, it is in a strategic place and is brainstem. And then you're like, okay, I want to know what do we need to do to remove this thing. And they tell you it's going to involve a 13-hour surgery. And we're going to have to go in through the nasal cavity. And we're going to have to go in and we only get one shot at this because if we don't get all this tumor, then it's going to come back. So I began to pray and I began to ask you all to pray and my son went through the 13 hour surgery and praise God they did the CAT scan afterwards and there's no sign of any tumor. But then the doctors say there's probably microscopic cells that are still there even though we cannot see them they're still there. Your son needs seven weeks of what we call proton therapy, radiation. For seven weeks, my son was basically tied down by the, the head, wearing a mask, bolted down to a, a bed, and given protons for seven weeks straight to a direct spot where this tumor was. My son lost weight. My son couldn't walk. My son would lost his appetite when he ate he was nauseated it was one of the worst times in his life and my son never complained once 
And he went through all that, and we went through all that because we realized there's something wrong, and we can ignore it, or we can go and do something about it. And if we do something about it, it's going to require intense treatment. This is the same with the United States of America. The United States of America, there are warning signs that something is not right. But we can say, you know what, it's always been that way. It was that way in the 1960s and the protests and the riots and the Vietnam War. And it was like that in the 1950s with the civil rights. And we can keep going back. And I would say you are 100% correct because this problem is not a new problem. It has been a slow problem that has been spreading like cancer. And if we don't do something about it, it will destroy this nation. And my concern for this nation is that we have declared our independence from a foreign king on the 4th of July, but I have a feeling that now as Americans we are beginning to declare our, de de our, excuse me, our independence from the king of kings. And if you, if you declare your independence from, from God and you say, we don't need you anymore, stay out of our government, stay out of our school system, stay out of our families, stay out of our laws, then God is a gracious God and he will remove himself. And we are going to be left here with looking at all the cancerous warning signals that are there and we're not going to be able to do anything about it. So that's why today I want to talk to you about not being independent, but rather being dependent. I want to talk to you about being dependent once again upon God. This nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles, and we were at one time dependent upon Him. But now it feels like we are no longer dependent upon Him. And I'm going to take you back in time this morning. I'm going to take you and we're going to look at some Old Testament passages and then we're going to end up in the New Testament. And when we're all done today, my hope is that you will have a heart's desire to do something for this nation. And what I'm going to ask you to do is pray. I'm not asking you just to pray for this election. I can tell you that a lot of people fervently prayed in 2016 for this election, that election. And then after the election, people stopped. And I can tell you that it feels like our nation is not calling people to pray during this nation, this, during this election. And we ask ourselves, where are the Billy Grahams? Well, the Billy Graham has served faithfully and he is now with the Lord. Where is the Ravi Zacharias? Well, he served faithfully and now he's with the Lord. And maybe we don't need a spokesperson to stand up at the White House with a million people there that he's speaking to us. But maybe God wants millions, if not billions of people who are Christians to begin to speak the name of Jesus. Not one person, but all Christians. And I believe that if we do that, then God will meet us in our time of need. But if we, like Machia said last week, try to, to fix things in our own strength, it's just a matter of time. Let me take you through a couple of passages. First passage is found in Psalms 33. It says, Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. It doesn't specify which nation. It just says, Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. Again, we were founded upon the Word of God. Our laws, our civil laws, reflect God's Word. But in context, the Old Testament passages was not referring to the United States. The United States wasn't around. It was referring, I believe, to the nation of Israel. I'm going to take you through this passage of scripture this morning is found in 2nd Chronicles chapter 7 and I've been doing a little bit of reading if you want to do a little bit of reading on the kings it's a little confusing because there's so much in such uh, little time but there's so much to read but you you have glimpses of 
the Kings and 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and 1 Kings and 2 Kings and 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. And they chronicle the kings of Israel, their rise and fall. And if you look at 2 Chronicles, it's chronicling a man by the name of Solomon. Now, if you know anything about Solomon, Solomon, God appeared to him in a dream and he said, Solomon, you can ask for whatever you want and I will give it to you. And Solomon did not ask for great wealth. He did not ask for his enemies. Instead, he asked for one thing and he asked for wisdom so that he could lead God's people. And God said, yes, Solomon, I'm going to give you wisdom. And because he gave him wisdom, Solomon was able to answer the toughest questions from people from all over the world. People would travel to hear this great wisdom. And with great wisdom, he said, Lord, I want to build you a beautiful temple. The greatest temple on, on earth because there is no greater God than our God. My father David wanted to build this temple and you wouldn't allow him, but allow me to build this temple. And God said, okay, build this temple. And he was not only wise, but he was wealthy. The nation was prosperous. It said that they actually had hundreds of shields that were made of gold, large and small. That gold and silver was as common as stones. When they built things, they said, use the gold. We have so much gold. They built uh, chairs of gold. They built chalices to drink of gold. They just had so much gold. And the nation was blessed. And Solomon's heart was right. He said, I want to worship you, God. So he builds this beautiful temple. And he brings the priest in. He brings the Levites in. And they play the music. And they offer up 120,000 sacrifices to the Lord. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And Solomon, in chapter 6, stands before the people and he dedicates this temple to the Lord. He raises his hand and he begins to pray and praise God. This is the way it should have been. This is a nation that had it all right. They started out with God and God blessed them. But then God speaks in chapter 7. Verse 12, it says, The Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer, Solomon, and have chosen this place myself as a temple for sacrifices. And then verse 13, but look what God says here. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or I command locusts, to devour the land, or I send a plague among my people. Now, wait a second. God is responding to the beautiful temple that they made. They have sacrifices, 120,000 animals sacrificed to the Lord. Solomon is asking for wisdom to lead his people. Solomon is praying to God, there's priests, there's music, there's worship, everything is right. And God says, when I shut the heavens and cause a major drought, or God also says, command at his word, to send locusts to devour all the crops and cause a great famine. And the one that jumps out to me the most is this last one. It says, or send a plague among my people. Normally when I think of plagues, I go to Exodus and I think of the plagues against, quote unquote, the bad guys. The bad guys are the one who enslaved God's people. Yes, God, get those bad guys. 
Because God spares the good guys because he sends the plague to the bad guys and he gives a remedy for the good guys and the remedy is a lamb. You take the lamb and you slaughter the lamb and you put the blood stains of the lamb and those who believe there's not judgment there, but there rather is grace and mercy and judgment passes over. I'm 100% behind that kind of plague, Lord. But I'm not sure I really want this plague because he says, when I send a plague among my people. And we don't like to talk about that. We don't like to say God would send a plague to his people, but we're not God and we can't redefine the scriptures. We're just simply stating the obvious as it says that he can and sometimes he does. But verse 14, there is the remedy again. If my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you, and you go off and you serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land which I have given them. And I will reject this temple that I have consecrated for my name. And I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all people. This temple will become, what does it say? A heap of rubble. The most beautiful temple that was ever built by human hands, laden with gold, sacrifices to God. God says, yes, I will, I will accept this temple. But if you turn away from me and you follow the other gods and you worship other gods, then I will destroy this idol that you have now made it a place of worship. Because you really don't want to worship me anymore. You want to worship fallen gods, foreign gods. And then he goes on to say, and all who pass by this heap of rubble, they're going to be appalled and they're going to say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? And people will answer, and here's the answer, because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why he, God, brought all this disaster on them. Now for those who are into theology, there's always a lot of debate among these passages among Christians because it's true, we are not Israel, we are not the Old Testament, we are the church, we are completely different. This command from God was specifically for the nation of Israel, that he would bring plagues among them, that he would bring about calamity if they turned away. It was conditional. We no longer need a temple, we know that from the New Testament because... The New Testament says that we are now the temple. We don't need 120,000 sacrifices because we have the ultimate sacrifice, that is Jesus, to forgive our sins. But I do believe that we are still worshiping the same God yesterday, today, and forever, that he has not changed, that he is still a God who wants to be worshipped, that he is a jealous God, that he doesn't want us to go and worship foreign gods. If you go and you look at 1 Kings, you will get the story of Solomon. And then if you get to 1 Kings chapter 11, 
it says that Solomon loved many foreign women. There's nothing against foreign women. God is not a God who hates foreigners. In fact, the foreigners, Solomon's prayer said that when the foreigners come to worship God, listen to their prayers too. The problem with the foreign women is that they had foreign gods. Solomon was a lot like his dad. David loved many women. Solomon started out right worshiping God, the wisest man on the planet. The scriptures tell us in Genesis that marriage is supposed to be between one man and one woman. That's God's plan. But Solomon said, you know what? I have a wife and I'm going to have more wives and more wives and more wives. And he's got a lot of wives, and I truly believe the reason why God didn't want us to have more than one wife is because you'll have more than one mother-in-law. <laughs> Amen, right? <laughs> Having a lot of mother-in-law, okay, I'll, I'll stay away from that. <laughs> but you know, these women who came, became part of the family, they brought their little idols, and they brought their little gods, and Solomon started letting them, yeah, we'll worship in the temple, but we're, yeah, yeah, we can incorporate that God into our worship. Why not? We can incorporate that belief into our system. Why not? And some of these gods that they brought in were fertility gods, and they were actually sexual immorality. And so in order to worship them, you practice sexual immorality, and it was socially accepted. Because if the king is doing it, it must be okay. But although the king of kings says, that's not my plan. And some of these little gods that they brought in, they were actually, you worship them through child sacrifice. And you would take a child and you would offer that child up to this pagan god. And again, if the king says it's okay and everyone is doing it, then it must be okay. But God says, no, that's not the way we do it. And sure enough, the nation was led astray. It reminds me a lot of our nation. I know we're not Israel, but it reminds me a lot of our nation. Our nation has been led astray. We've asked God to get out of our politics. I know chaplains who've been in the military, they say it's very difficult to be a Christian chaplain in the military because you have to chapel all people and so you're under the government authority. It's hard to stand up for biblical principles because now your government says, no, that's not how we do things. We don't want prayer in school and yet our schools, we see the, the warning signs, we see the school shootings, we see all the bullying Machia mentioned it last week that pornography is eating away our culture. It's eating away our teens, our preteens, husbands and wives. We are viewing pornography and it is shaping our thinking of the way God has intended for sex to be between one man and one woman. We have redefined marriage in our culture and the culture says it's okay and the government says it's okay. And again, I believe everyone should have rights. I'm not saying you should treat people disrespectfully. But I got to tell you, it's not according to God's word. Neither is divorce. All these things that are the now the new normal, this is the United States of America. And we wonder why there's problems. And people, I've seen signs and you've seen signs that says no justice, no peace. But here's the reality. Do we really want justice? Because if we get before a holy God, apart from Christ, you're not going to have peace. No Jesus, K-N-O-W, K-N-O-W, peace. 
This nation is longing for peace. But we have looking for it in the wrong things. Do we need to reform our police? I believe we do. I'm not saying defund them. I'm saying we need to make things better. Same with our military. There was a Fort Hood soldier who ended up being killed a couple of weeks ago, a month ago. Something went wrong, and we need to figure out how, to, how that shouldn't happen. There's problems all around us, and I would say it's just like when my son was diagnosed. We don't see it until it starts to bring it to the surface, and we're going to have to acknowledge it and say we need to do something about it. The nation of Israel didn't do anything about it. But God kept his word and God allowed foreign nations to come and overthrow them. In fact, let me just take you down memory lane. There's a, a guy by the name of Daniel. Let me read to you what, what happened in Daniel chapter 1. And it's almost like God is saying, look, if you want to worship pagan kings and you want to worship pagan gods then all right, I'm going to turn you over to the pagan king so you can live under their authority. And this is what he says. In the third year of the reign of Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, it's one of the kings, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. And the Lord, notice who does it, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the Babylonians' hands. Along with some of the articles from the temple of God, these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonian. And he put them in the treasury of his God. God allowed the nation of Israel to be destroyed because they turned away from him. Guys, this is something that I would never, ever fathom, but I, I got to ask the question. If God could destroy a temple that was consecrated to him, if God can destroy the people that were his people in Israel, and God would turn them over to a foreign nation, then why do we believe that God wouldn't do this to other nations, including the United States of America? So we think it never happened to us. And yet we look at our economy. We are in debt. Trillions of dollars in debt. We have a plague spreading. We can't even meet together. Social unrest. Hatred for authority. Division in politics. And you know what? This has become normal for us. It's not normal. This is a warning sign that something is wrong. But you know what Daniel did when he was in a foreign captivity? In fact, many of you may not know this, but they be it's believed that he was castrated along with all the other male prisoners. They were castrated because you don't want male males in the house of the king's harem with other women. So you castrate your, your people that you bring into slaves. He was actually forced to have a strict diet that was not according to his Jewish custom. And he was also told by this foreign government that you can't pray. Because if you pray, you will die. And you know what Daniel did? Scriptures tell us, I think it's in Daniel chapter 6, that every day he would go and he would pray. In fact, look, I'm sorry, I got it right here. Chapter 6 says, Now when Daniel learned that this decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the window was open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and he prayed, and he gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group, and they found Daniel praying. 
and asking God for help. By the way, Daniel was the guy who was thrown in the lion's den. God spared him from the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were thrown in the fire furnace. God spared them as well. They were in captivity, according to the prophet Jeremiah, for 70 years. This now is, he's going to be an old man, castrated, given a, a command, you cannot pray, servant of foreign God. He was given a foreign name, and he had to, they had to worship foreign gods, or they would die. And Daniel, every day, no temple, no priest, no sacrificial system, none of that anymore. All his freedoms are gone. But his God was still there. And every day, three times a day, probably for the 70 years he was in captivity, he got on his knees, faced Jerusalem where the temple once was, and he said, he asked God for help. This is how you bring healing to a nation is that you got to pray. You got to. Vote. I, I want you to vote. But gosh, that's not going to fix the underlying problem. Only Jesus can fix this problem. You got to pray. As the great philosopher once said, you got to pray just to make it to, as a joke, I tried. Let me tell you what 1 Timothy says. 1 Timothy is to the church, it's New Testament. This is what Timothy, um, this is what it says here. I urge that first of all, that petitions, that prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for, what does it say? For all people. Not some people, but for all people. Then it says, for kings and all those in authority. Why? And it says, so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is what the Lord wants for his people to do. Machia last week challenged us to go home and rent this movie, watch this movie called Jesus in Athens. And if you haven't watched that, I would encourage you to watch it. I finished watching it and I want to become a missionary now. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful story about Jesus the hands and feet that we will look beyond politics and we will see people in their time of need regardless of religious beliefs and they will be ministered to in the name of Jesus. And you see many Muslims coming to Christ because of the church, being the church and not playing politics. But I'm going to challenge you to watch a movie too. This one is called War Room. Some of y'all have seen War Room. War Room is a wonderful movie. It's about an old woman who goes into her closet. In fact, that's what Jesus says. He says, when you pray, it's good to gather together corporately. But Jesus says, when you pray, go by yourself into your room, your inner room, where only your heavenly Father sees you. And he says, pray. And in this movie, this little old lady is praying for marriages. My wife and I were walking last week and we bumped into an old friend of ours we haven't seen in a long time and and I've been praying off and on for this person and this person said to my wife and I she said I have been fasting and praying for my marriage her marriage. And when we left, I looked at my wife and I said, Honey, I don't fast and pray. I pray. But I told her, I said, I don't fast. And if I do fast, it's to try to like lose weight. It's the wrong reasons. But after Justice was diagnosed with cancer, 
Well, let me back up. We had gone on vacation. We were driving through Denton, Texas. We went to worship at Denton Bible Church. My old mentor, Calvin, knew that we were in town because we posted a picture that we were in Denton. He called me up. He said, hey, can you just meet me and my wife at the gas station before y'all leave town? And so we're like trying to leave town. And we're like, okay, sure. I introduced him to Justice. I introduced him to Isabella. I introduced him to Josiah. Of course, he knew my wife. My oldest son wasn't with us. Shortly after that, we get the diagnosis that Justice has cancer. Calvin is a man who fasts and prays. I've known him for over 20 years, and he is a man who's always fasted and prayed, and he began to fast and pray for my son. The, the brothers of this movie, War Room, they were asked, the, the Kendricks brothers, they were asked, where did you get this little old lady's character? Because out of all the movies they made, this is the one who actually, this movie is actually has the most box office sales. And they said, the little old lady that's the prayer warrior, how did you get her character? And the brother said, well, to be honest with you, she's modeled after our mom and our grandmother. They said, we have seen our grandmother pray, our mother pray. And so when we created this character, we don't know anything about movies or film producing or casting. And so what we have done is committed large amounts of time to prayer for these movies. And so this video I was watching of one of the Kendricks brothers with their 70-year-old mother now, she takes care of their father. Their father was diagnosed with MS and he's in a wheelchair. And so this little old lady who's in her 70s, she likes to garden. And so she's carrying these buckets filled with fertilizer. And she's a little old lady just hobbling like this. And this is what she does for her enjoyment. And the, the brother went over there and he says, Mom, let me hold that because you're going to hurt yourself. You need to take care of Dad. So for her birthday... The brother woke up and he said, God put it on his heart to buy her a golf cart. And he says, Mom doesn't play golf. And they looked at the price of these golf carts and they're thousands of dollars. And he's like, why does mom need a golf cart? But God put on his heart, your mom needs a golf cart. He called his other brothers up. He has two other brothers. And he said, God put this on my heart mom's birthday that we need to buy her a golf cart will you pitch in and the brother said if God put this on your heart we'll do this so they bought her a brand new red golf cart for her birthday the family was gathered they brought her outside she was blindfolded they said open your eyes now mom she opens her eyes and the brother drives up in this beautiful red brand new golf cart and the mom begins to weep and they said, Mom, why are you crying? She went into the house and she grabbed her Bible. And she had a little index note that she had wrote. And she said, Lord, if it's not too much to ask, I want a golf cart for my birthday. And God heard her prayer. And God hears the prayers of Daniel. And God hears the prayers of all the people who cry out to him. And God hears the prayers of us. And maybe we don't need to start for praying for the nation. Maybe we need to start for praying for our, our families. Maybe God wants to start a revival in us. But if we don't pray and we continue to do our own thing, I got allergies today. I believe God is just going to just let us destroy ourselves. So here's what we should do. 
fast and pray. Fasting doesn't necessarily mean you have to give up food. That's a good start. I tried that this week. I put in a piece of bread in the toaster and I said, I'm going to pray as long as this piece of bread's in this toaster. And I went two minutes. I fasted. And then the toaster popped. And then I devoured my bread. That's a joke. But we are called to give up things. Maybe, maybe we give up some of these things that we're on, whether it's Instagram or Facebook. Maybe it's give up all the news that we're consuming. Praise God that many of us have given up these sports. We can't even watch sports. There's no sports. But maybe we give up something and we turn back to God and say, God, I want to seek your face. I want to confess my sin. And not only do I want to confess it, I want to turn away from it. I want to stop living like the world and start living for you. And then the last thing is I would say, I would say that God wants you to be his hands and feet in this nation in your home, in this church. We got to wake up. We got to realize that this is not right with plagues, with civil unrest, with all this tension. This is not right. Something is wrong. But God hears the prayers of those who seek him. Now I'm going to do something that we normally don't do. I'm going to ask that you would just pray with me for a moment because I believe that you don't need to hear all this what we need is to pray and then we're going to close in a song and for some of you even in here if you want to humble yourselves before the Lord and get on your knees feel free to do that if others just want to sit and lift up your holy hands feel free to do that but I would ask you just to pray. I'm going to pray and then the worship team, y'all can come up afterwards and close us out. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for turning away from you. Forgive us for not being the people you want us to be in our families. Forgive us for not being the husbands that you want us to be, the dads or the moms or the wives you want us to be. Forgive us, Lord, for, for wanting us to, for us wanting to put politics above you. Jesus, you're the only hope for this nation. Lord, we ask for a revival first and foremost in our own families. We ask for revival in our own church. Lord, we ask for revival in this nation. That those people who are called by your name, the name that is victorious, the name that is above all name, the name that every knee shall bow, the name of Jesus. That those who are called by your name, Lord, that we would be your hands and feet and we ask for revival in this nation. Heal this land, Lord. Open our eyes. And people who are far from you, Lord, we don't want them to experience judgment, Lord. We want them to experience grace. We want them to come to the cross and their brokenness and find forgiveness. Lord, we love you. I ask these things, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen.
our all, our whole heart, our whole lives. God, I can't wait to see what you're doing. I can't wait to see the ways that you're moving and everything that you have going in the works at this very moment. You have not failed us. You will not fail us. Father, we love you. (laughs) And with all of our hearts, it's still not even the tiniest fraction of how much you love us. Help us submit to you, devote ourselves to you, sacrifice of everything that we think holds value, and just surrender it and see all the beautiful things that you're going to do. It's in your son's holy name we pray, amen. Church, we love you. Please know that we are praying for you. Please feel free to reach out to us. We're available through social media. We're available through phone numbers, through email. There is always a way to get in touch with a leader in this church. If you need prayer, and we all do, please don't hesitate to reach out. We'll see you next Sunday.